Well, hello everybody. This is a re-recording of the session that was going to be week 11, but unfortunately didn't get recorded. But um, I felt it was such an important session and really sort of worked and integrated with everything else that we just couldn't let that happen. So I have re-recorded it for you and I really hope that you are blessed by this message. So the message is called Know Your Position. And one of the things that we realize um, as we're getting to know the Lord and as we're getting to know who we are in Him, that there is a position that we all hold in the Spirit. And we really need to know this because when the enemy comes at us and attacks us and tells us that we have no power, we have no authority, that um, really, you know, who do we think we are? Who, who do you think you are? As if God's going to use you for anything. But this is not true. And so I'm hoping that this message will help you to realize that you have a position in Christ and it's a very important position. And whatever we carry in God, God has given it to us not only for our own strengthening, but also for the strengthening of all those people around us and ultimately for the strengthening of the church and all those that are going to come into the church as the Holy Spirit pours out his power. So I pray that you are truly blessed by this message. So the message we're going to be um, basically basing this on is Romans 5 chapter 1. So I'll just start with the, with the chat, with this uh, verse. Therefore, since you have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we also rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces character and, sorry, suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts through the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. So from this passage we can see that the position in which we stand is through faith. So through faith we have been justified, leading us to a position called grace. And this basically is what is termed as justifying grace. So a lot of people are kind of confused about what is grace, what is justification, what is righteousness, and hopefully we're going to untangle some of that today. So the term justified is a, 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 is a translation of the G Greek word dikaiosis. Now I'm sorry to all you Greek speaking people because that's probably not quite right, but it's actually a technical legal term derived from the verb to make righteous. So in Romans 3.24 it says, We are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ. So grace is given by God's own will and decision. It is a pardon, in essence, that is free and undeserved and is offered to all of us in our pre-grace state as sinners. So the important part of this part of it to understand is that justification doesn't rely on something we have done other than through our faith that allows justification to come in. So, what actually is grace then? So, the Greek word for grace is charis, and sort of think of the word charity, and it will kind of make sense. It is the state of kindness and favor towards someone, 
with a focus on a benefit given to the object that receives it. By extension, it could be classed as a gift, a benefit, a credit, a kindness, or a blessing. So the Wesleyan understanding in the Book of Discipline defines grace like this. The undeserved, unmerited, and loving action of God in human existence through the ever-present Holy Spirit. Grace pervades, pervades all of creation and is universally present. Grace is not a gift that God packages and bestows on us and creation. Grace is God's presence to create, heal, forgive, reconcile, and transform human hearts and communities, and in fact, the entire creation itself. So, wherever God is present, there is grace. So in a way that's helping us to understand, if God is present, there is grace. So his grace is part of his presence. Grace brought creation into existence. Grace birthed humanity. Grace bestowed on us the divine image, redeemed us in Christ Jesus, and is ever transforming the whole creation into the realm of God's reign of compassion, justice, generosity, and peace. So therefore, grace by extension of all of that is actually a power. It's part of God's power. And in fact, it encapsulates God's power. The Bible, the Bible dictionary puts it this way. The main idea of grace is that it is a divine means or help or strength. Grace is in fact an enabling power. It enables the recipient to do and to be what he or she cannot do and cannot be if left to their own means. So I don't know about you. But I know that most of the teachings on grace that I have received in the past has really been about how grace is this free thing that we all get um, when we get salvation and we didn't earn it. But it's far, far more and has far more reaching powers and implications than a lot of us realize. But if we start to actually understand how we can tap into grace as the empowerment that God has given us, it's going to allow us to actually overcome many more things than we may have realized. It's not just a gift that was given at salvation, basically to cover your sin. It's much more than that. So it's not only a quality or inclination of God's nature, but also an influence, a force, a power, or an action of God that works in us to enable us to endure and stand through suffering and towards obedience. Grace produces real, practical outcomes in our Christian walk. Now that's really good news, you know, because I don't know if you've ever been in a trial and you actually realize how truly weak we really are. You know, we think we're, we think we're pretty strong, we think we're standing strong, and then when you really, really get in the midst of a trial and everything is being stripped away, you actually start to realize how weak we really are. And so this is really good news because one of the things that allows us to endure in suffering, trials and tribulations and stand in God is the power of grace. All of us need this enabling power. This is the power that God has given us, 
not only to be able to stand, to be able to believe, but also to overcome our great enemy, sin. Romans 5, 20 to 21 says, Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more, so that as sin reigned in death, so um, we know that sin allows death to reign, grace also might reign through righteousness leading to eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. So basically what this is saying is when the law was given, it let sin be sin because where there was no law, no one was really able to sin because what 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 law were they breaking? But once the law came in, it actually gave sin more power in a lot of ways because suddenly people were going to be held accountable for their actions, whereas in the past, all that sin was doing was killing them. It was actually killing people, and that's why God gave the law to slow down sin's capacity to kill. Sin was always going to lead everyone to death. The law was given so that people knew what it was, knew what was killing them, and to actually try and preserve people through the process of life. As you know, when you first read the Bible and, and in the beginning of Genesis, etc., people lived for up to 900 years. And now we have been given about 70, 80 odd years on the earth. Obviously, some people live beyond that, but that's the three score and 10 that it talks about. Now, why do you think that might be? Well, my um, the thing I think that it, that, it, that it tells us is that because of sin's power and how it can just take hold of a person and grow and grow and grow, I believe God had to cut short the life of man because sin was growing and growing in people. And imagine how much damage a person could do on this earth if they were sinful and could live for a thousand years. Sin would be perpetuated on a scale that we've never seen. At the moment, even the worst of the worst people with the most evil in them, we know they're going to have a shorter lifespan, maybe up to 90, 100 years. But imagine if they could keep going. Imagine if Hitler could have kept going for a thousand years. The fact is the whole earth would have been destroyed. So the law was a necessary thing that had to happen so that People had an opportunity to back out of sin. So, so basically, God's grace was extended to us as his antidote to the power of sin. So the simple definition of undeserved favor that most of us have been taught you know grace is undeserved favor you can't earn it it's a gift that is that is totally true but the point is this it is so much more than just that this favor overflows in powerful practical helpfulness and instruction from God in our daily life to resist sin but also to help our obedience towards righteousness. That help is called grace because you don't have to work for it by strictly observing the law as the Israelites did when it was first given. That is the free gift part. You see, we don't have to work for grace anymore by keeping perfect observance to the law. The, the, um, God our Father has poured it out to us through Jesus Christ as our Saviour. And that is very good news for us because strict law observance, as we know from reading the Bible, 
was almost impossible for our human hearts that are so bent towards evil to do. So Romans 11, 5 to 6 says, At the present time there is a remnant chosen by grace, but if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works, otherwise grace would no longer be grace. So isn't that wonderful? God has chosen a remnant. We've talked about that before, how God chooses people so that there's always people on the earth who are carrying the message of salvation, who are carrying God's light, who are bringing his life into this world. And aren't we so privileged to be one of his remnant? So we can't work to earn grace. Grace is poured out by God through the power of the Holy Spirit, because of our faith in Christ. It is free, and it is totally undeserved. That's why we can't work for it, because it's not by the works that we're doing, like the people of Israel were through the law. It is a righteousness that comes by faith, that requires effort on our part. And this is where I think sometimes the teaching has got a little bit awry. It's almost like some people believe they don't have to do anything at all in the Christian walk because all things have been done for them. But the truth is this. Righteousness, working in obedience towards righteousness, requires us to have faith and a desire to follow what we do know and what we have been given through the teachings of the Bible and through the teachings of Jesus Christ, who was our rabbi or our teacher. And we do have an obligation to follow through with that so that we can walk in righteousness through faith. Faith in Christ gives us justification, and justification gives us peace with God, and peace with God gives us grace. Because in our first scripture it said, therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So this is very important because up until we have peace with God, because of the fact that we are born into a sinful for world and usually walk in sinful ways, we are automatically an enemy of God because we sit under the power of Satan himself. And so this is actually how we make peace with God, because we believe in Jesus he extends grace, which is the gift that gives us the empowerment to stand against sin, and that allows us to have peace with God. In Romans 5 1, it says, um, sorry, in Romans 5 1, the one that I've um, just, just read, Paul is assuring believers that God's offer of redemption obtained by Jesus Christ is a declaration of peace. Because of Jesus's obedience and sacrifice, God once again has granted humanity access to his divine presence. So remember, Adam and Eve had access to God's presence, but once they were driven out and the cherubim were put in place with the flaming sword, they could never access his presence again. And the only people right through the Old Testament who were ever able to access God's presence were the prophets. But no one else was able to come anywhere near God. Just remember the way the Israelites acted when they knew God was going to come down on the mountain. And they were so afraid that they basically said, well, Moses, sorry, you have to go up the mountain. We're not going anywhere anywhere near God, he's way too scary, and we will die, and they were right actually, we will die if we go into his presence, and so basically they sent Moses off up the mountain and thought, oh well, if he doesn't come back and turns, you know, he's, he's burnt to a crisp, well we'll just carry on down here, and maybe we'll make a golden calf and start doing a few sacrifices just to make sure we've still got a God. 
bit tongue in cheek, but basically they weren't going anywhere near God's presence. And there was a jolly good reason for that because God's presence was terrifying to people who are in sin. So grace is God's gift of pardon to the entire human race. Now this is important because God didn't just offer this grace to Israelites or a few select people. He's opened it up to anyone and everyone who wants to come in through the door of Jesus Christ. So Jesus becomes the door of access back into the divine presence of the Father. So through faith, we benefit from this pardon by being justified. And some people term it like this. Justified means just as if I'd never sinned. So justified is like anyone who has a sentence against them and a judge says, I'm granting you pardon and there is no other debt to pay and there is no other recriminations coming against you. So God, as the judge of all men and all of the earth, is able to do this righteously. So the ultimate aim for us is to free believers from the power of death. Sin leads to death. All of this is about taking us out of sin's power and putting us back under the power of life. This liberation finds completion at the resurrection. And that's the future event spoken about in Romans 5.10. That's why resurrection is often referred to as the Christian hope. This hope forecasts God's promise in the gospel of an expectation and anticipation for the climatic gift of a renewed body that is immortal and finally free from sin's influence. Therefore, no more death, no more decay. Now, I think sometimes it's just we just sort of take a lot of things for granted in the Christian life rather than really thinking through what God's plan is here. His plan is to, to right a wrong that cannot be righted for us otherwise and to preserve humans so that he can still have a human family. The first fruit of this family, the firstborn of this family is Jesus Christ who in a way is the, um, the reason he's the firstborn is because he is not the first Adam. The first Adam is you and I, completely human. He is, in a sense, a hybrid, a new Adam. And that new Adam carries the divine and the human in a body. Now, this matters because if you don't have a body, you are simply a spirit. To be a human, you must have a body that is physical. So what's happened here is the first Adam's race is doomed for destruction. The second Adam's race, born through Christ is going to inherit the earth once again. And we will be given these new bodies that are not under the power of sin and therefore are mortal. So, talking about this standing by grace, what does that really mean for us? So the verb tense of the, um, where it says here that we have gained access by faith, that term gain access indicates that that standing by grace creates not a momentary thing, but a permanent state. So what this is saying is that 
we don't just stand for, you know, five minutes or 10 minutes to make a plea or, 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 or in the presence in way of an audience or whatever. This is actually something that is a permanent state once we enter into it, as long as we stay in faith. And this is the key. This is where I believe a lot of teaching has gone awry. You need faith to stand in grace. So our standing is based on grace. We can stand and have peace with God because we recognize that our access to God is offered as a lasting privilege because of the faith that we have in Christ Jesus. So as I say, we're not just brought to God, you know, every now and then uh, for a visit or, you know, to make our little plea. And then, you know, that's it. Just like, you know, you can't just go and see the queen. You can't, just, or the king now, sorry. You can't just turn up. Um, you have to be invited. There has to be this big ceremony. You have to be, you know, all pumped up and all perfect before you can go in there. And then there's all this protocol you have to uh, follow through with. But what's happened here is, God's actually said, you're allowed to come into my presence and then you are allowed to remain, not as a visitor, but as a member of my household. You're allowed to remain because I'm going to adopt you to be a full, a full son or daughter. Not secondary, not, not you know, not like, um, you know, Cinderella who was in the family, but she was just there to do the to do the cleaning. No, this is full acceptance as a son or daughter. And by, fa by faith, we can come into God's presence and behold his face and walk in the light of his countenance. Those beautiful words are by the theologian Clark. This is the important thing. Because you see, it's by beholding God's light, it's by beholding his face that we actually are transformed from glory to glory. And that is why Moses and many other people in the Bible talk about, can I see your face? Because it says in another scripture that if we look into Christ as a mirror, we will be transformed from glory to glory. So isn't that amazing? We're allowed to go back into God's presence so that we can behold him. So peace with God is worth pursuing. The exhortation that through faith we will possess peace with God is good news considering how many worldly, and spiritual forces have been set up to deprive us of any form of peace. But also because of the terrible destruction that comes upon a person's life when they have no peace. If we lack peace within ourselves or with other people, we cannot find peace in the face of the ordinary demands of life, have no peace in the midst of troubles and trials that do actually befall us all, have no peace in our conscience because we can't stop sinning and doing what doesn't um, benefit us and therefore often have no peace in our relationships on earth but also with our Heavenly Father, we are destined to suffer. Peace of mind, peace of conscience occurs when we have found peace with God. The joy and the tranquility of an undisturbed mind, free of distorted thoughts and passions, free from the effects of of human or demonic oppression is the goal of receiving peace with God and comes from this justification by faith. I don't 
don't know about you, but I need peace. When I look at all the chaos that's around us in this world, when you see the anxiety and stress that people are under, when you know that people are just under so much stress and so troubled in their minds, I tell you what, to find peace, to know peace, to pursue peace is one of the greatest things we can do. And the beautiful thing is, Jesus Christ is our peace. He is the Prince of Peace. And that's why we have access to peace, because of our faith in Christ. So, the upshot of all this is, we need faith. So, we have to actually cultivate faith in order to accept our justification is through grace or we can lose our peace with God and therefore feel that we have also lost our access to his presence. If you don't pursue God's presence, can I just encourage you to ask the Holy Spirit to show you how to come into God's presence because there is nothing greater than to know you are in God's presence and communing with him. He desires communion with us, and in our response, we should des desire communion with him. What if you knew you had a father somewhere, and you were longing to speak to him, and there was a phone sitting right beside you, but you just never had the courage to pick it up, and talk to him. What a tragedy that would be, especially if he had been waiting forever for you to do exactly that. So sometimes when people are in trials, they really do feel like they can't hear God or they feel that God is not there anymore. And sometimes it's known as the dark night of the soul. And I don't know if you've ever been through this experience, but I have. And it's just honestly, for someone who does like to spend time with God and listen to his voice, it's, it's a really, 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 really hard thing to go through. But it often does happen to people in the midst of suffering. If people find themselves in a fiery trial, and erroneous, erroneous, erroneously believe that God is to blame for their current plight, this can be even worse. Sometimes people do blame God. Instead of thinking about how this has all happened, a lot of our trials do come from our own um, wrong actions, our own wrong decision making. Also, sometimes they come from other people's wrong actions and wrong decision making, and we get caught up in that. Um, sometimes it's through sickness and, and other things that happen, financial loss. And people blame God for this. They, 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 they don't actually really think about why this might have happened. And usually this is because Satan, who is very, very clever, as we know, has been able to convince that person that they have lost favor with God. Because he doesn't really love them. Or he isn't really kind and good. Or they are no longer acceptable because they made some kind of mistake. Now, this is serious because many people have lost faith through a trial. And this is because people who believe that God is to blame, they actually in a way, shut the door to God themselves. They shut it to his presence because they believe what the enemy has told them or erroneously the enemy has told them that God has shut the door in their face. Now this, my friends, is a total lie. God does not shut the door on us. But our faith can wane and suddenly we lose access because we don't have the faith anymore to enter in. 
So if God knows that this is something that can happen to a person, then why let us suffer? I think this is a fair question. But sufferings are allowed by God to weaken our flesh and to teach us in a very important thing called patience in order to strengthen our character and develop true faith. No one knows if they have faith until their faith is tested. I know that when I went through a major, major trial, before the trial began, I was pretty convinced that I had pretty strong faith. But I can tell you halfway through when I genuinely did not think I would make it, I realized that a lot of my faith was built on what I believed of my own strengths and also some sort of um, erroneous teaching around my expectations of God and how I felt about people who, um, you know, people shouldn't have to suffer. And really, um, yeah, when I came out of that, I can honestly tell you I was quite a different person. And I look back on it now and I am very, very grateful that God had enough faith in me to put me through that trial so that I could learn true faith. So coming out of um, these trials is patience that strengthens our character, that develops true faith, and a strong, humble character helps us to hold on to or stand through faith, even in sufferings. And the result of that is hope which is produced in our spirit by the power of the Holy Spirit. This hope is an eager expectation that doesn't disappoint because the Holy Spirit, who's dwelling in us as we stand in faith, fills us with a knowledge of God's love for us. And that is what produces the peace that we need, the knowledge that God truly does love us because perfect love casts out all fear. And if you've been through a severe trial, fear nearly always comes to torment us. And one of the torments is God does not love you. God does not care for you. So if we're able to hold on, the Holy Spirit will start to fill us with this knowledge that God does love us. And that knowledge that God loves us helps to cast out these fears. And we have to know that God is with us through these sufferings. This, well I know in my life and I know in many people that have come through trials and actually come out the other side. Once you really know God really loves you, actually it stimulates that reciproc reciprocal love for God and we begin to really love him in return. So God is always the initiator and we're always the responder. But, you know, sometimes we have to work through these trials to find out what it is that we really believe and often it doesn't really come to the surface until it's tested. So if you've ever in it, been through a trial or in a trial right now, all I can say to you is, do not give up on God. He is there with the power of grace to get you through. He will pour out his grace on you if you ask him to. Some advice from some great men of faith about trials. This is from Martin Luther. Whatever state tribulation finds us in, it amplifies. If we are carnal, weak, blind, wicked, haughty, and so forth, tribulation will make us more carnal, weak, blind, wicked, and irritable. On the other hand, if we have faith and become spiritual, Spiritual, through the process, we will become strong, wise, pious, gentle, and humble. We will become more spiritual, 
through the trial if we stand through faith in Jesus because the power of grace will allow us to take hold of this power that produces this powerful, wise, gentle and humble spirit. And this is what Spurgeon, another great theologian, said. Paul says tribulation works patience, but in the, in the natural or in our flesh, this is not so. Tribulation works impatience, and impatience, impatience rails against the experience and then sours into hopelessness. Ask someone who has buried a child or lost their wealth or has suffered pain or sickness, and they will tell you that the natural result of affliction is to produce irritation against their circumstances, rebellion against God, questioning, unbelief, petulance, and all sorts of fleshly reactions. But what a wonderful transformation takes place if through steadfast faith, the heart is renewed by the Holy Spirit. Isn't that encouraging? Because I know, having come through several very deep trials, that once you take hold of grace, grace can bring you through. And that just requires you to keep believing, keep holding on, Keep standing on the word of God and on the truth of God and something amazing and incredible will happen in your spirit if you can do that. Because a trial actually reveals what's truly in our hearts. The trial does not make us bitter, unbelieving, angry at God, lacking in faith, etc. It actually exposes that this is indeed our true condition. But remember, where sin abounds, grace abounds even more. God is willing to extend mercy to us if we will turn to him in faith. Romans 8.18 says these wise words, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory of that is to be revealed in us. And it also says, The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now if we are children, then we are heirs. Heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If, indeed, we are willing to share in his sufferings, that's Jesus, in order that we might also share in his glory. See, the thing is this. Jesus had to suffer in the flesh in order to be a true human. He had to allow himself to suffer in the flesh. And that's what a trial is doing. A trial puts our flesh on trial. And that allows us to see a true condition. And then if we accept, yes, I am fearful. Yes, I am weak. Yes, I actually have rebellion in me. Yes, I have doubt. Yes, I have fear. Yes, I have unbelief. God, help me. Give me more grace as I recognize these things. Forgive me, Lord, that I haven't um, realized in the past that this was actually still in my character, but see me through God. Help me to get through this. He will. I can promise you that. Through faith, we also become inheritors, as it talks about in the scripture just before, of all of God's promises. Because Abraham, the father of all of those who are justified through faith, our entry into being considered as offspring comes through Abraham, and we won't go into that today, but it is 
part of our inheritance comes through Abraham's faith. We come in through Abraham. God promised Abraham that his offspring would become heirs of the world through faith. So, through Jesus and our belief in him, and through Abraham as our spiritual father and his faith, we come into all of the promises of God. And it says in Romans 8.16, Therefore, the promise comes by faith, so that it might rest on grace and may be guaranteed to all of Abraham's offspring, which is the church and all those that believe in faith, through faith, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham. Without weakening in his faith, I've missed out a few um, verses here, but I'm getting to the part that's important. Without weakening in his faith, he acknowledged the decrepitness of his body since he was about a hundred years old and the lifeless lifelessness of Sarah's womb, yet he did not waver through unbelief in the promise of God, but was strengthened in faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God was able to do what he had promised. When we become fully persuaded that God can do and will do what he has promised, even in the light of delays and the trials of our faith, we become inheritors with Abraham through Christ of our assigned place as the children of God. So this is our position. We are the children of the living God. We are following Christ's example of bringing the light of God, the love of God, the life of God into this lost, dark planet and into the people who can hear and see that there's a way out. There's a way out of their sin and suffering on this earth. And guess what? In Romans 8.19 it says, For the whole creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. So my friend, the whole expectation is awaiting your revelation. Because they need to know that there's a way out and a way through. And the truth that you carry and the light that you carry and the life that you carry and the testimony that you carry might be the very way that they're going to get out. So bless you. I hope this has will help strengthen you, especially if you're in a trial or feel that sometime in the future you will be in one, that some of these words might come back to encourage you. Thank you.